All right, thank you so much, Lori. It's really exciting to be with all of you today. Uh, my name is Eric Colette, and I am the CEO of A Mind for All Seasons. And I've spent the last 20 years working with people living with dementia and helping their families and the professionals that serve them know how to make a real difference in their lives. And I'm excited to be here with my really good friend and business partner, Randy Vaudry. Um, he is kind of the brains behind the Enhanced Protocol. He's the chief architect of what it is we do with this protocol. And I know you're going to get a lot from uh, his experience today. So at the outset, I wanna share with you a story and it's kind of a personal story. The couple that you see on the screen are my paternal grandparents, Ralph and Irene Colette. And they were wonderful people, very talented. Uh, a lot of people acknowledge the things that they did. My grandfather was a homesteader. Uh, he homesteaded a few hundred acres outside of Boise, Idaho, in a little tiny town there. And uh, he was the kind of guy that could do a little bit of everything, whether it was plumbing or carpentry or farming and ranching. Um, very good at all of those kinds of things. And my grandmother was so sharp mentally that um, as her family grew and she had many, many grandchildren and great grandchildren and uh, children, she could start in January and rattle off everyone's birthdays, day, month, year, in order going through the entire year. But over time, as they got a little bit older, things started changing. And we started noticing that they were a little bit forgetful. My grandma especially started getting, you might say a little bit funny. Sometimes people say that and, and uh, sometimes people joke about, oh, we're having some more senior moments or eh, there was kind of another brain fart going on there. And we all thought it was just normal aging up to a point. And then things got to the point that grandma was clearly not remembering some of the things that she normally would be able to handle with ease. And so some of uh, the family started reaching out to her doctor saying, you know, we're a little bit concerned here. Things don't seem quite right. And at first the doctor said, eh, you know, she's getting a little bit older and sometimes we get a little bit more forgetful when we're getting older. But family members were feeling like, no, this, this seems a little bit different. There's a lot of stuff that she's having a harder time with than she used to have. And over time, she got a lot more confused and eventually the doctor gave her a diagnosis of dementia. By the time she passed away with dementia, she literally got to the point while staying at an aunt and uncle's house that she could get up from the bed in the night to use the bathroom. And the bathroom was just like five to 10 feet away from the bed and she would get lost on the way to the bed. And my grandfather wasn't doing that much better. He got more and more confused over time. And so here were two amazing people in my life, and I had to watch them just slowly ebb away. Well, I want to ask you, what, what do you suppose was done for my grandparents? What, what do you think was my family's experience going through this? What, what is it that our healthcare system has to offer them? Unfortunately, what was offered to them is the same kind of stuff that I hear from a lot of people nowadays. There was first a little bit of denial and, oh yeah, I, I think you're just kind of getting a little bit older and a little bit of downplaying of some things. And then as symptoms got worse, it was, oh, let's diagnose you with dementia. And then there was a little bit of medication that might improve memory a little bit, but we don't know if it's actually gonna work. And that was pretty much it. And my family was left to fend for ourselves in, in trying to figure out how to navigate this horrible situation. It's kind of like somebody pulls you into the doctor's office, gives you a diagnosis, and, and it's like they, they put you into a boat, remove the oars, and shove you out into a rough ocean. You, you don't even know how to go anywhere. You're just sort of cast adrift and and, and wondering how you're gonna navigate all this. How are you gonna make things happen from there? So what if there was a different story? What if there was something that allowed my grandparents to have real answers? What if someone was able to sit down with them and after doing some lab work, uh, say, hey, your cognitive decline is starting up because of these factors. 
And if we act now and we do this, 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 and this, um, I think you could improve your cognitive functioning. Now, I, I don't know how things would have ended for them specifically, but I'd like to think things, think things would have gone differently. And I certainly think that if someone had sat down with my family and sort of taken us by the hands and said, here's exactly what you need to do to help your loved ones function as well as they possibly can. And gee, if we catch it early, maybe, maybe we can turn this around and keep them out of long-term care or keep them from being completely dependent on another. What if there was a story like that? What if there was help like that? I think that would be amazing. Now, I have spent much of my career running assisted living and memory care communities, first as a program director and then as an executive director in charge of the whole operation. And for a long time, I've watched people just sort of slowly decline. And I learned early on that there were certain things we could do to improve quality of life for people with cognitive problems. We could keep them more physically active. We could keep them hydrated. We could make sure that they took their medication in a routine way instead of binging one day and not getting anything the next day. And over time, it felt like, yeah, I was making a little bit of a difference, but it, it still felt a little bit like I was running the morgue waiting room. And that's kind of an abrupt way to put it, but it felt like, gosh, I wish I could really do something more for people. Well, our goal today is to convince you that we don't have to wait any longer to do something more, that there is something powerful that every one of you can do to protect your brains and prevent dementia. And there is something powerful that all of us can be doing to support those living with dementia and help them function better than they're functioning now and have a better opportunity for some improvement. So first, a little bit of quick review. Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia, is named after Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who was a German physician that um, in 1906 noticed uh, when he did an autopsy on a, patient, on, on a patient that he'd been following for a few years, a characteristic pattern of tangles and plaques. And this was a woman who was 55 years old. She had progressive and rather aggressive cognitive decline. It was scary stuff. And ultimately, when he got into the brain, he found that there were problems that look like this. Notice that from the left side, which shows a healthy brain, to the cutout on the right side, there is massive devastation. A lot of people don't realize that Alzheimer's disease is at work for 10 to 20 years before the first symptoms really show up. So although it's normal to get a little bit more forgetful about certain things when we get older, progressively getting more and more forgetful or just not being as crisp mentally is often a symptom of an underlying problem that takes years in the making to get to the point that we've got a real serious problem with it. Now for a long time, really since 1906, people have been wondering what on earth causes Alzheimer's disease? The part of the brain, if I go back to this slide, the part of the brain that controls memory, um, or at least a lot of our memory functioning, is the hippocampus. It's like the memory control tower. And it's also ground zero for Alzheimer's disease. And if you look at the slide um, and compare the left side to the right side, you see that the hippocampus is almost non-existent. The memory control tower shrinks down almost into oblivion. In fact, nowadays we can do an MRI and measure it. And for a lot of people with advanced Alzheimer's disease, that memory center of the brain may only measure in the fifth to the, the tenth, maybe the twentieth percentile. So these are cases where people are missing a lot of the memory center of their brain. That's why they're so confused and repeat themselves over and over. You notice that the disease spreads to the rest of the brain though. And eventually it's not only affecting memory, but it affects motor skills and speech and vision and all of our cognitive skills. So what causes it? Well, I wanna give you an analogy that will help you understand what's going on in the hippocampus, the memory center, and in other parts of the brain. Most people realize that if you break a bone, your body produces new bone cells and you, you grow new bone. And some people realize that 
the body actually makes new bone cells every single day. And if you start losing bone cells faster than they're being formed, you can get brittle bones. We call that osteoporosis. And sometimes if there's a lack of calcium, and especially if there's a lack of hormones, um, particularly in women, then osteoporosis can be a real problem. So in the brain, the hippocampus actually produces new brain cells. That's relatively recent knowledge, just in the last couple of decades. But in most people's brains, the memory center of the brain makes about 700 new brain cells every day. So how do you get to the point that that memory center of the brain is a, a big crater? Well, you start losing brain cells and connections between those cells faster than they're being formed. So you get synapse breakdown faster than synapse formation, and you get Alzheimer's disease. It's kind of like what would happen if uh, you sloughed off skin cells faster than they were being formed every day. Can you imagine that? How devastating that would be to that, that outer covering of our bodies, that important organ that we call the skin? Well, a lot of people wonder why we don't have a cure. And the reason why we don't have a cure, I believe, is that until pretty recently, our approach to Alzheimer's disease has been based on two fundamentally flawed assumptions. Assumption one is that if we just have enough funding and we spend enough time and we do enough research, we can find a drug that will cure this disease, a pill that you can take that makes it all better. And assumption number two is that amyloid beta protein is the problem. Clear back in the early 1980s, researchers were saying, we think that amyloid beta protein, which is what forms the sticky plaques in the Alzheimer's brain, we think that that protein is both the cause and the symptom of the problems that we call Alzheimer's disease. And if we can make a drug that gets rid of amyloid beta, we'll solve the problem, right? Well, unfortunately, there are drugs that get rid of amyloid and nobody gets better and a significant number of people actually get worse. So amyloid isn't necessarily the problem. It's a little bit like what would happen if we started out with the assumption um, or, or noticed the correlation that every time you get sick, your white blood cell count goes up. We know nowadays that that happens because that's the immune system being activated. But what if we didn't understand that? And what if we just noticed the correlation and we mistook that for causation? And we said, all right, every time you get sick, your white cell count is up. Therefore, elevated white cell count makes you get sick. So I'm gonna make a drug that helps lower the white cell count back to what we would consider normal. Can you imagine what would happen? People would get a lot sicker. People would die of things that normally they'd recover from. And it's all because we would start with a fundamentally flawed assumption. So this idea that you can make a pill that solves the problem and that that pill needs to deal with amyloid beta has led us on a wild goose chase for years. And there's no pharmaceutical magic. There have been over 400 drug trials at an average cost of $50 million per trial. And we have no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Those are scary figures. We've spent truckloads of money trying to figure out how to deal with this. And yet the best that we can do is kind of slow the disease process a little bit for some people. And we do it at the risk of some pretty serious side effects for others. Dr. Dale Bredesen, said that treatment for neurodegenerative disorders represents the greatest medical failure of our generation. And it's killing more and more and more people all the time. Well, Randy and I and our team at A Mind for All Seasons and the team at Avista Senior Living are on a mission to save as many people as possible, millions of people from going down that road of destruction. And more and more uh, important neurologists in the world and researchers are stepping out and saying Alzheimer's should be a lot more rare than it is because it's a lifestyle kind of illness. It's largely preventable. So here's the difference in what Avista Senior Living is doing. Avista is actually on a mission, if you can believe it, as an assisted living facility to try to help as many people as possible 
not have to move into their community. I think that's amazing because at the end of the day, none of us really wants to live in a long-term care setting. I think we all want to stay home. And so Avista Senior Living has adopted the enhanced protocol, which allows people to dramatically lower the risk that they're going to need assisted living or another type of long-term care. But not everybody is at a point that they could do that. Some people do need assisted living. So in partnership with the Mind for All Seasons, we're trying to help um, keep people from needing to stay in assisted living forever. What if we could move them back home? And if that's not in the cards for somebody, what if we could keep them in assisted living instead of memory care? Or if they do need to be in memory care, what if we could keep them off antipsychotic medications and actually recognizing family members and able to talk a little bit more than the typical advanced Alzheimer's patient would? Throughout the rest of this presentation, we're gonna show you how that's possible. And you're gonna understand why it shouldn't be frightening that researchers are jumping out of, uh, of uh, research into Alzheimer's drugs. Let me introduce you to one researcher. I actually mentioned his name earlier. His name's Dale Bredesen. Um, he's a highly credentialed researcher who spent about 30 years studying Alzheimer's disease, most of it at UCLA. And a lot of the time was spent trying to develop medications that would help people either live better or actually get rid of Alzheimer's disease. And along the way, he made some important discoveries that helped him understand why one drug is not going to cure the problem. That we have answers when uh, the root cause of problems are single issues. Like you get sick with a bacterial infection, you take an antibiotic and you get better. But we don't have a lot of answers for the chronic things that people are now dying from. People live longer than they ever have, and yet a lot of times the last decade or two or even three of life are spent with heart disease and diabetes and uh, consequences of strokes or Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. Why is that? Well, it's because these diseases are caused by multiple factors. And Dr. Bredesen realized through his research that the perfect Alzheimer's drug would have to do all this stuff. That's a lot of stuff. And we are certainly not gonna get into the difficult, very technical details of it, but it's a little bit like you have a, a roof with 45 or 50 potential holes in it, and you wanna stop the house from leaking. And so you go out and you do a really good job of patching one hole. Well, you can't just patch one hole and expect the roof to stop leaking. If you want to stop the roof from leaking, you've got to measure where the holes are and you need to set about patching each one. Some are bigger than others, but they all make a difference. Now, Alzheimer's research has kind of been about monotherapies, finding one thing. It's like you find the drug that will have a difference that's measurable and you test it against a placebo. Well, that's a lot like trying to patch one hole and maybe you can measure that the house is filling with water a little bit slower when it rains, but doggone it, it is still filling up. It only buys you a little bit of time. So Dr. Bredesen took a totally different approach because he realized you can actually measure a lot of this stuff. And arguably you could influence all of the stuff that's on the list. Now, along the way in my journey, I met Randy Vaudry who is an amazing nurse practitioner who has been helping people living with dementia since 2001. He spent a lot of time working in skilled nursing facilities and then consulting with them. He's spent a lot of time in private practice. He's also owned a med spa. Um, he's owned a mental health practice and a supplement store. He's done a lot of things to make life better for people, especially older people. And when I met Randy, I was amazed. I sat in his living room till midnight one night, and I left that night absolutely convinced, based on his experiences with real live patients right here in our home state of Idaho, that we didn't need to wait to make a difference for people, that you could actually make a difference now. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Randy Vaudry, who's going to talk about how we take some of these insights from Dr. Bredesen and what it was that he did in his research 
and how we've taken all of that that's really complex and we've packaged it in a system that is simple and straightforward that anybody can take advantage of, whether you live in an assisted living community or you're living at home trying to avoid ever needing to go to assisted living, just wanting to keep your brain as sharp as possible. So Randy, I'll let you take it away from here. Perfect, thank you. And as you looked at that last slide, it's very technical, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very simple as I walk you through these interventions. A local pharmacist introduced me to this research paper all the way back to 2014. And if you look at the title, it was called Reversal of Cognitive Decline, kind of a new therapeutic approach. And it struck me as really interesting. So I devoured the, the research and began implementing a system dating back, clear back to 2015. And that took me to uh, Dr. Bredesen's training. Dr. Bredesen began explaining how to manage people with cognitive decline or early Alzheimer's and ways that you could uh, stimulate the brain to regenerate or at least minimize the ongoing dis destruction so that people didn't deteriorate into that setting that Eric talked about with his grandparents. And I had the opportunity to go to Dallas, Texas and study with Dr. Bredesen where I learned about some of his early case studies. So as Eric hits the buttons along these, you'll see that in case study number one, there was a 66 year old male that had a genetic predisposition towards having Alzheimer's and they had done lots of studies, PET scans and MRIs. And in these MRIs, they actually measured the part of the brain that deteriorates with Alzheimer's disease. After 10 months of following his protocol, you'll see the very last bullet on this slide, that an individual grew back their hippocampus from the 17th all the way to the 75th percentile. That's amazing that someone could grow that back after having loss. In the second case study, there's another example of an individual that was 69 years old and self-employed. This individual had um, PET scans where they scan the brain and some genetic tests where they identified that this individual also had one of the genes for Alzheimer's disease and they had gone through neuropsychiatric testing three different times over a 10-year period and they showed that this decline had been progressive over 10 years and the local neurologist basically said look you better get your affairs in order because there's nothing we can do. This individual worked with Dr. Bredesen and you'll see on the last bullet point that after 22 months of following a very specific therapeutic intervention, this individual gained back from the 13th percentile to the 17th percentile, the part of the brain that controls language and the ability to find words and recall words. And those are remarkable results. So it's not anecdotal. They actually verified this in neuropsych testing and also by MRI. And it goes to show that by following a very individualized and personalized approach to Alzheimer's, you can make massive differences in the parts of the brain most affected by Alzheimer's disease. So, and he went from the 13th to the 79th percentile. I, I think he said 17th, but yeah, amazing improvement there. Thank you, yes. So Dr. Bredesen began dissecting what Alzheimer's disease is. And instead of saying Alzheimer's disease is one disease, he subtyped it. And I think that that probably resonates with people, especially in assisted living centers, because you can have individuals that are 55 years old who are very impaired and individuals who are 85 years old who are only modestly impaired. And those diseases do not look the same. They're not as aggressive. They, they have different characteristics. Some people, they just present differently. And Dr. Bredesen characterized that because certain people have inflammatory types of dementia. Some have dementias related to um, diabetes where their blood sugars are just too high and their insulin and A1Cs are too high. Many individuals have what are called atrophic dementias which means that they're very, very low in sex hormones and they have suboptimal thyroid problems. We see this probably more often in women than men because women who go through a hysterectomy early in their life and they lose the brain protecting influence of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone, 
that are oftentimes produced in the ovaries, they have a greater tendency to ease into a cognitive decline or a dementia. Still others have a toxic dementia that Dr. Bredesen called vile dementia. And these are people that have really early onsets. So they might be in their 50s and their symptoms are often preceded by things like terrible migraine headaches or multiple chemical sensitivities. Oftentimes they have chronic fatigue syndromes and fibromyalgias and chronic pains. Those types of dementias present very differently. And so it's super important when we're taking care of people with a form of dementia or Alzheimer's that we identify what type are they so that we can effectively address their underlying causes. I'm certain that there might be some skeptics out there because I've run into them many times throughout my practice. They say things like, there's no cure and no treatment. All the evidence is anecdotal at best. You're just selling snake oil and giving people false hope. There's not enough people in these study groups or the study groups are too small and they need to be replicated. And I'm okay that there's some skepticism. But you got to consider what is the research say? And Eric had a pretty interesting experience in looking at some different research as it pertains to Alzheimer's. Eric, do you want to cover the Finnish trial? Sure. So um, one of the criticisms of Dr. Bredesen's approach is that it's too complex because basically what he did to sum it up is that he would go and measure all those holes in the roof. He, he realized in his research that there's, uh, at first he found 36 factors and now there's close to 50 different things that have been associated with the kind of decline related to Alzheimer's disease. And so he just went through and he measured all of those factors and he developed a very personalized program that involved shifting people's diets, getting them more physically active, replacing nutrients and hormones they were deficient in, um, treating for toxic exposures and other interventions. And uh, he saw the amazing results that Randy has talked to you about. And people said, well, yeah, you've got a couple of small groups of 10 people that have these kinds of things. And he was arguing, well, yeah, but those results are unprecedented. We need to do this on a larger scale. And a lot of the review board said, well, you can't do research that way. It's multifactorial. There are too many things. You've got to test one variable against a placebo. You don't understand how research is, is to be done. And Dr. Bredesen said, well, you don't understand how Alzheimer's disease works. It's not caused by one thing. It's caused by a lot of different things. So I, I share with you the Finnish geriatric trial where the, it was the first really large scale trial of a multimodal approach. Now they weren't doing everything that Dr. Bredesen was doing with his patients, but they followed um, a, a group of people who were engaged in dietary guidance and physical activity and cognitive training and social activities. And they really monitored metabolic and vascular risk factors and showed that it is possible to get people to do that on a larger scale and they do a lot better, that it really does work. And um, I, I think it's important to take those kinds of studies into account. One day I did a really interesting experiment. I was actually in the Sky Harbor Airport there in Phoenix, and I was waiting for Randy to come. We live in different parts of the state of Idaho, and so he flew in on a different airline, and he was gonna be about like 45 minutes um, later getting there than I was. So I had a little bit of time, and I thought, I'm just gonna experiment here. I'm gonna go on to PubMed, which is the government website for published research. And I'm gonna start seeing how many studies I can find in about 20 minutes related to hormone and cognitive functioning um, or uh, physical activity and cognitive functioning or uh, dietary interventions or insulin resistance or any of the things related to Dr. Bredesen's work. And I expected that I'd have to search a little bit, but I, in very short order, found literally hundreds of studies that have been done on these individual aspects. There's a reason why Alzheimer's disease is nicknamed diabetes of the brain or type three diabetes. There's a reason why um, the Mayo Clinic showed years ago that women that had early hysterectomies and never did hormone replacement have doubled the risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
There's a reason why there are all these connections and yet pursuing any one of them in and of itself is not a cure. The magic happens when you address all the factors. It's kind of like there's the scales of justice and there are many different factors that will cause the scale to tip toward cognitive destruction and, and to allow you to start experiencing dementia symptoms. And to tip it back the other way, you can't just put one counterbalancing thing on the other side. You have to put a lot of different interventions and each one has an effect. But you know that's tricky to measure in a large scale study because how do you know which variable is having the most effect? And we would argue and Dr. Bredesen would say, all of them have an effect. Well, as Randy mentioned, he went off, he trained with Dr. Bredesen and this was after he had already um, written his own version of the protocol based on the research that he had seen and read and dug into. And so instead of what my grandparents went, to and went through and what a lot of people go through where you go to the doctor, you do a pencil and paper test, maybe a little bit of imaging to rule out some vascular dementia issues. And then the doctor says, yeah, you've, you've got dementia, probably of the Alzheimer's type. Maybe you've got some vascular dementia going with it. Here's a prescription for Aricept, or here's some Namenda, or here's an Exelon patch. Come back in six months and we'll see if you're any worse. Which again is like being put in a boat without oars and just shoved out and expected to figure it out on your own. Instead of that, what Dr. Bredesen showed and what Randy and I have experienced is that a really comprehensive dementia analysis involves a lot more. Gone are the days when it's acceptable to say, well, there's not much I can do for you. There is a lot that can be done. But not everybody responds exactly the same way. At the, at the root, um, what we're doing in all this is a functional medicine approach. And functional medicine has to do with identifying root causes of a disease and addressing the root cause versus pharmaceutical medicine that's involved with uh, giving a medication that will either mask a symptom or treat a symptom in some way, or in, in some instances, there really are medications that will turn around an infection or illness. But functional medicine says, why, why did you get this in the first place? And how do we address the root cause? And I wish I could sit here and tell you that everybody that we've ever worked with has improved as much as some of the patients in Dr. Bredesen's study. We've written, I think we're somewhere over 400 um, treatment summaries in the last couple of years. And we've seen some amazing improvements with people, really amazing. But we've also seen some people where the best that they got was just steadiness, the decline stopped. And Randy and I started saying, well, if, if treating cognitive decline is like managing a scale and it takes a lot of counterbalancing measures on the other side, to tip us back into cognitive health. What on earth could we add to it? We realized that managing stress was a big issue. And so we had already worked in a coaching component. People, if you just go out and read um, Dr. Bredesen's book called The End of Alzheimer's, or if you read his research, it's really difficult uh, to understand it. It's complex. So people need a guide. So we developed a coaching system where you have a memory coach that takes you by the hand and says, let's go through this together. And we write a treatment summary and then turn that into a daily checklist that helps make it easier to get through it. But even with all of that, is there more that could be done? And that's where Randy and I started looking at functional medicine and energy medicine. The idea that um, the body responds to wavelengths of light. Randy's going to talk us through some of the approaches that we found very briefly. We're going to go through this pretty quickly because we want to get to your questions. But I'll just tell you that we have now seen people that were almost flatlined. They quit declining, but they weren't improving a lot. And when we added in these additional treatment modalities, that's when uh, we saw one lady that had been participating in the enhanced protocol for a year without a whole lot of improvement. And she wasn't really able to talk very well. But when we started using some of these other modalities that are also available at the summit at Sunland Springs, she was able to start talking again. 
and laughing and she got her personality back and she is still really impaired, but she is still living at home with her husband who is able to take care of her because she's improved her functional level. So Randy, I'll let you take it from here and walk us through some of these treatment devices quickly. Eric mentioned at the beginning that I have run a med spa for many years and I work in a naturopathic office uh, a couple times a month and have now for a couple of years. And I've always found it interesting how divided the public is. Some of the public say, I'll never take those pharmaceuticals. All my doctors wanna do is throw more medicine at me. And the other half of the population says, naturopathy is witchcraftery. And I would never do that because there's just no science. And the, there's a truth that falls right smack dab in the middle. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of treatment interventions that Eric mentioned. They're gonna feel Star Trek-y and maybe even a little bit goofy to some people. But I invite you after you participate in our discussion today to go online and just Google some of these interventions and Google the name of the intervention and Alzheimer's and look what you find. It'll blow your mind. Um, in the work of energy medicine, there's a lot of modalities that you can see on your screen that act like a photosynthesis, okay? Here's what photosynthesis is. We all know that a, the sun shines on a plant and the plant takes the energy from the sun and makes glucose molecules with it and the byproduct is oxygen. And we're grateful for that because we breathe that oxygen. But in the human body, there are other forms of taking energy from the atmosphere and, and from our environment and doing something with it to improve our body's health. And everyone understands the first one is that we make vitamin D in our skin from UV light that comes from the sun. Uh, the sun hits our skin and it turns cholesterol into vitamin D. We know that we treat babies in the hospital with a form of light therapy so that they can clear their liver of jaundice. That's been going on for a long time and no one feels like that Star Trekky. But sometimes we lose this as we get older and we don't understand how these things can apply to us, especially with Alzheimer's disease. Um, this picture is my mother's light. My mother has psoriasis. And in psoriasis, the plaques in her skin and the inflammatory response associated with arthritis gets better when exposed to certain wavelengths of light. Okay, so there's lots of ways this is applied. This researcher, or this researcher in this slide, his name is Michael Hamblin. He's considered the father of photomedicine and he works at this little teeny tiny unknown university called Harvard in Boston, Massachusetts. And he has researched the power of red light to change the way that energy conducts in our brain. Okay, so he calls it photobiomodulation, which basically means how light affects our biology to produce a positive effect. And I'll further describe that as the way that light allows our brain to function better. I read this article online recently about this gentleman named Larry Carr. Larry Carr was a linebacker who had terrible CTE, which is basically head injury after head injury after head injury that led to total mood disorder and was leading him into dementia. He embraced the principles of photobiomodulation and started noticing changes in his MRI. It's a very legitimate medicine. He actually did his studies at, at Massachusetts General Hospital back in Boston. And he now shifts over to a home use of a device, whereas this is the helmet that he used when he was in treatment. He now has a device that can be used in, at home or in a clinical setting. And they have this device at the summit where we shine very specific wavelengths of light into areas of the brain to impact the brain's ability to produce energy and function appropriately or function better. There are applications of this type of therapy all across the country. This bed is a bed that the Olympic team took to Rio last year and the swimmers and the track and field team use this bed as the anti-inflammatory treatment associated with their exercise routine. So it's been very much embraced in athletes. Uh, you can buy lights where you just stand in front of them, portable lights that you shine on your head. They've been FDA cleared as a class two medical device for minimizing symptoms of chronic disease. Okay, this next intervention, a David Delight Pro, is um, a device where you put on some glasses 
and you use some beats in your ears with some headphones and those little clips clip onto the bottom of your ears to send a little teeny tiny pulse of electricity into your brain to stimulate certain wavelengths of the brain. The reason this is so powerful is that people with dementia oftentimes have wavelengths of their brain equivalent as if they were sound asleep. And they just have a blank stare and there's just nothing going on inside. But if you can gently massage those wavelengths of the brain using specific devices like this, their brain waves get better and subsequently their brain function gets better. Now I can tell you that Robeson, who's on our panel, I brought this device to the summit a little over a year ago and left it with Robeson and said, give this a try. And he looked at me and he's like, oh, Randy, you've really lost your mind. And after about one quarter, when I came back a couple months later, he put that on the desk and said, Randy, this thing is magical. I can't believe that we don't use more audiovisual entrainment in assisted living centers to help individuals with terrible anxiety, mood orders like depression, and sleep disorders, because it can make a huge difference. Um, we use another device called Exercise with Oxygen Therapy. This particular device is called LIVO2. Everyone knows the benefit of exercise. And I go to assisted living centers all across the country and I see exercise rooms that are empty because many seniors just struggle to know what to do. With a health coach, you can put someone on an exercise device like a recumbent bicycle, and then you connect them to a face mask like a, a CPAP. It's like a CPAP, but not the same thing. And then they breathe um, oxygen contents that are about four times the oxygen content of room air. So we're getting their heart rate up, we're increasing circulation, and now we're doing it under the influence of more oxygen. And it's amazing how much better they feel. It's probably my experience with this form of training is most individuals will say that they're able to exercise without feeling wasted or totally exhausted after exercise that they just feel enlivened and enriched because of the amount of oxygen that they get. So it's a very powerful intervention. So I could go on and on and on, and I know we're about done with our time frame today, but I just wanted to emphasize out there that when I hear um, patients or their doctors say to me, well, I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it's a downhill course from here because there's nothing you can do. I get aggravated by that because there's so much that you can do. I hope that you learn the, to start early because I do not believe that losing your memory is a natural part of the aging process. That is disease. And if caught early, we can make a massive improvement in the rate of decline. And for those who are already in assisted living center, there's so much that can be done to strengthen them. And so without getting into all of these interventions on the screen, just know that the enhanced protocol embraces the research of Dr. Del Bredesen, neurologist from UCLA, Dr. Richard Isaacson, neurologist from the Dementia Prevention Clinic at, at Cornell University in New York. It embraces the therapies from Dr. Shirzai, who runs the Loma Linda Dementia Clinic in Southern California. There's so much that can be done, and we invite you to come and participate in the protocol so we can see what we can do for you. Thanks, Randy. I want to sum everything up so that you know in simple terms exactly what the enhanced protocol is and why it could help you or a loved one. So basically, we do a comprehensive analysis through blood work of about 45 different factors that are involved in whether the brain tips toward cognitive destruction and you start losing brain cells faster than they're being formed or it protects the brain and uh, you make brain cells faster um, than you're losing them. Then um, we give a comprehensive, we call it a roadmap report because it tells you how to go from where you are to where you want to be cognitively. And we also look over everything that is going on in terms of your medications, your health history, your life history, all the things that would affect you. We turn that comprehensive report, which is usually it runs 20 to 22 pages long, and it's like the user manual for your body, but it's a little bit complex. And so we turn it into a daily checklist that makes it simple for you or people caring for your loved one to follow. We offer coaching and support related to diet, as well as other aspects of the protocol. 
Um, you get support in terms of how to increase your physical activity. We train you in what are called the vital five pillars. These especially come into play if you've got a loved one with dementia, because these are the five key things, overarching principles that allow family members and professionals to interact more effectively with people that they're serving. We also provide unlimited access to a trained memory coach like Robeson that can walk you through the process. And we include these medical devices as part of the protocol. So when we refer to the enhanced protocol, it is a comprehensive system um, to help improve cognitive functioning for individuals. And it can be done in the home uh, for uh, remote clients or any, anywhere in the country, or it can be done um, in a center like our brain therapy studio in Boise or the therapy studio that Robeson has there at the summit. Um, you also get some good pricing on supplements as part of the protocol. So remember my grandparents that I talked about and the path that they went down that's like so many other people? I postulated the idea that maybe there could be a different story. Well, let me tell you about a guy named Marv Levitt, whose wife Sue has given us permission to talk about him. Marv had gone through three years of pretty aggressive cognitive decline. He was struggling. He was normally pretty kind of cantankerous and gregarious with his wife. He would tease her and rib her a little bit, but he was getting to the point that as his brain declined, he was getting mean. And they went to three different neurologists that said, hey, I'm so sorry, you've got dementia and there's not a lot that I can do for you. And as he declined over time, things got so bad that the kids said, mom, it's time to get help. You, you've got to move dad into a community so that you don't lose yourself. And so she moved him to the summit at Sunland Springs. Thankfully, she also enrolled him in the enhanced protocol. And after five and a half months of treatment, he went from a cognitive score of 16 out of 30 on a Montreal cognitive assessment to a score of 30 out of 30. And he moved back home on December 10th of 2018. Here is Sue with a very brief explanation of what she went through. Eric, can you turn up the volume? It's as loud as I can get it. I'm so sorry. Why don't you give us the highlight of what was spoken? All right. So, so I, I apologize. The audio wasn't loud enough on that particular recording, but she was saying that um, his personality came back. He was now sassy and rude again. And she would um, sit there in the chair next to him and recognize that he was teasing her and that his personality came back. And um, at the end of it, she says, I got my husband back. That is a powerful statement. And it is something that fires me up every time I see it because I spent so many years of my career watching people go the other direction. I wish I could say everyone did as well as Mark. Not everyone does, but doggone it, we can make a difference for people and we can make a difference for you. And we're so excited to do that. I wanna bring Robeson on here so that you can uh, briefly meet him. He is available right there in your area to help make a difference for your brain health and the health of those that you love. Good afternoon, my name is Robeson Flynn. I am the memory coach at the summit at Sunland Springs. Um, we've been running the Enhanced Protocol for over two years now. We've had quite a few uh, amazing experiences. Um, for everything from, of course, Marv, who was able to move home to his wife, and they were actually able to take a road, road trip across the Western United States after uh, discharging from us, um, all the way to, you know, someone who has an advanced uh you know, dementia, but is able to improve to the point where they can recognize their spouse again. Um, and we spoke a lot to the uh, issues with 
um, anxiety and depression, which so often accompany uh, dementia, that you oftentimes see people who do have these uh, terrible afflictions, and then we, the conventional uh, wisdom there is to put them on a psychiatric drug. Um, but along with that comes, you know, a loss as we are, as their cognition does improve and we re requires less hands on um, coaching. Great, great. Another question is, do you have to have an official diagnosis in order to do the enhanced protocol program? No, you do not. Um, you know, we've treated everything from people who are, you know, considered late stage Alzheimer's to, hey, you know, I got my 23andMe results back and I have the gene, the APOE gene, 4-4 uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So I want to do something about this so I never develop it in the first place. I, I'm going to jump in just a minute on that question as well, Robeson and Lori. Um, one of the most powerful things that we can do is help people prevent cognitive decline. So a lot of professionals find themselves in their 40s, 50s, early 60s, and they just don't feel as sharp and crisp as they used to. And we can do pretty advanced cognitive testing where someone might test totally normal on a pencil and paper test at their primary care physician's office. But when you do a neuropsych workup and you do more intensive testing, you find out that they're in the 40th percentile in certain things, and they really are losing some ground those are the people that see the biggest results from this, where they have really impressive turnarounds and they're, they're ensuring a different kind of future where they're not going to need to live in assisted living and memory care. That's great. Um, Rand, between Randy and Eric, I'll let you answer this. What is the success rate of folks improving versus staying the same or decline? That's a great question. And Unfortunately, it's hard to answer because if I take someone who is uh, quite compromised, then they have to apply the interventions over a longer period of time to notice some benefit. Whereas Eric just mentioned, if someone's still living at home and is in their early 50s and just may not feel as sharp, oftentimes they notice massive benefits in the really early stages that the key is how many of the, of the root causes are in affecting that individual's cognitive decline and how complex is it to correct those root causes. So that answer really varies from individual to individual and it's hard to give, um, it's hard to give a concrete answer, but I will say this. Um, I believe that once individuals start, most of them want to continue forever because no one wants to start and feel really good and go back to <laughs> what caused the cognitive decline in the first place. So uh, that doesn't mean that everyone stays with us forever, because once they learn how to do some of these things, many can continue to do that. But as Robeson mentioned, many people find that having an accountability friend, the motivation to come, the therapeutic devices that they can, that they can apply really make a difference in the long run. That's great. Quick, quick experience related to that. During COVID-19 at our therapy studio here in Boise, we had to shut down things for a while, and we were just coaching people remotely helping them stay on the dietary interventions and supplementing the things that they needed to, but they couldn't come in and receive some of the medical device treatments. And a lot of the clients that couldn't come in and do that started losing ground. And we started getting phone calls from people saying, oh my gosh, this is essential for me. I am slipping. I, can you please, please, please open up because this is essential. And um, it, it's a little bit like going to the gym. If someone says, well, how long do I have to work out before I don't need to work out anymore? We would laugh at that because living a healthy lifestyle is something you have to keep doing mm -hmm. or you're not healthy anymore. And when it comes to brain health, our goal is to teach you interventions, help give you a jump start, get you back to where you need to be, and then help you live that lifestyle and eat in brain healthy ways, move in brain healthy ways, supplement in the right ways for your body throughout the rest of your life because if you don't, it's just like falling off the wagon with your diet or stopping your gym membership. But this is our final question and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate everybody coming on the call and 
to Randy, Eric, and Robeson being able to provide such great information. The question is, uh, my, fr my father-in-law lives at the summit and was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. Does the enhanced protocol address his condition? I'll take that answer or that sure. question. When Dr. Bredesen first um, initiated the steps to reverse cognitive decline, there was a, a real focus on Alzheimer's disease. But we're recognizing that cognitive decline between different forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or frontotemporal lobe dementia or stroke or CTE, have many characteristics that are similar. And so we always encourage people, if they don't have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, that doesn't mean they can't participate in finding what their root causes are and addressing them. And specifically to FTD, we have felt that there's a toxic component to those individuals that many of them struggle with things like heavy metal toxicity or organophosphates, severe oxidative damage. So I think there is a lot of things that we could try to uncover and work towards even in individuals who have different forms of dementia. Great, thank you. We will follow up with you in an email to see what we can do to help address your father-in-law. Well, I certainly do appreciate everybody and we will go ahead and have this recording emailed out and available for you to forward or to review again along with your copy of 10 Tips for Improving Brain Health. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.